This is the Getsy Health Podcast with Janique and Tristan Roney. Hey, you guys, welcome back to the Gutsy Health Podcast. Hey, everyone. We have one of our most favorite people on the literal planet, the, the universe. I mean, it's Dr. Elia Gregoris again. He is gracing us with his presence. And welcome, Elia. Welcome. By the way, welcome. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Janik. It's good to be back. And just so you guys know, Elia is like a father figure, a brother figure, an uncle figure mm-hmm. to us. Like he's he's like blood. He's blood to us. And so um, when when I think family, I think Elia. He's he is he is just one of the most wonderful men that we have ever met. And so so we are so happy to have you here. Mm-hmm. We are so happy to talk about your new book. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Congratulations. So Elia, introduce yourself a little bit and tell the listeners why you are just so lovable and so wonderful and all your credentials and all the things that make you special. I mean, that's always hard to do, but uh, let's just say they call me the happiness doctor. So that's that's kind of like my, <laughs> my nickname. Um, mm-hmm because happiness is my passion. And uh, I remember the first podcast we did with you guys was about my first book, Seven Paths to Lasting Happiness. Yes. Well, did I know, or did you know that you'll have me back on the show for another book? This book was not in the cards to be written in 2020. I'll tell you that, but there's a story behind it. Well, tell us that story. How did did this happen? Because the timing is so perfect for what's going on right now. so perfect. So the, the story is this, on March 15th, I had a very strong impression and it was as loud as I'm talking to you right now. And that impression came from outside. It could be, you can call it the spirit, the inner wisdom, your intuition, whatever you attribute that voice to, to me was as loud as I'm talking to you right now. And basically it said, Ilya, you need to get a book out of the pandemic and you need to do it now, not next November, not in 2021, People will need to hear this now. That's insane. So, so I call my my writing partner Konstantinos Apostolopoulos. Oh, How's no. that for a nice Irish name? That's great. <laughs> Holy cow! <laughs> that my fellow Greek Irish. brother, uh, <laughs> and uh, and he and I write together for Thrive Global for Ariana Huffington's Thrive Global. So you know we know that we write well together. Anyway, I called him up and said, "Brother, I'm going to write a book about the pandemic. Are you in or are you out?" And he didn't hesitate a second. He goes, I'm in. That's amazing. And basically the message was, you got to get this book out in 45 days. Now, mind you, that sounds so ridiculous because my first book, you know, which became a number one bestseller, you know, uh, in the self-help category, took me three years to write. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So getting a book out in 45 days is insane. Did you sleep? (laughs) Did you sleep during those 48 hours? 45 days. 45 45 days. (laughs) You know, the ebook came out exactly May 1st, you guys. Amazing. We made it. You Amazing. Know, and the uh, paperback came out on May 10th or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, so where there's a will, there's a way. And I've had a complete paradigm shift because, you know, it's all these years people say, you need to write another book. You need to write another book. Well, I don't have time to take two or three years out of my life to write a book. Mm-hmm. Well, now I can do this in 45 days, especially if I have a great partner like him. Yeah. He's detail oriented and I'm big picture. Mm-hmm. So we're a perfect combination. I come up with the big stuff and he takes care of all the details. We've got a great cover. I don't know if you have the book with you or you can show it, but we do. Uh, yeah. we, actually we have do it have on the it. phone right here. Right Excellent. Yes. So, and, and I will show it right here because I'm, I'm really proud of this cover because it's, it's really about navigating. It's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It is. Do you have an audiobook version? No, they've told us we need to write. That's coming. Kind of, I haven't had the time, and there because ever since the book came out, we've been doing. Personally, I can tell you, since May, the middle of May, every single day of the week, a podcast, a webinar, a radio interview, a television Amazing. interview, print. So I mean, we, yeah, we did a press release, and we've just been bombarded by that because people are like starving for its message, they and are. its message is very practical and easy. Like people can read it in two hours. How's that? It, it's awesome. not like oh, wow. my happiness book. I mean, it, you can read it quickly. So it, I had one lady who said, you know what? I've read both of your books. I like this one more. <laughs> and I'm like, and I was almost offended. I'm like, what do you mean? You didn't like my number one bestseller book? You like this one more? Why? Oh, awesome. She goes, I have ADD. So it was easier to read. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so, so tell us a little bit about what the book entails and how, like what was the... I, I mean, the inspiration behind it was the COVID, but but tell us a little bit more about 
its details? Well, the inspiration, yes, was pandemic, but it really was about any crisis and mm-hmm. it's written in such a way because the pandemic won't last forever, hopefully, but there are crises in life all the time. I think the reason why, and it's becoming a very critically acclaimed book right now. Initially, we wrote it for individuals, how to help the individual mm-hmm. to successfully navigate this crisis that we're facing. Mm-hmm. But what we're finding out right now, especially as the economy is opening up, that companies or in, in organizations, profit and nonprofit companies who are bringing their employees back are asking us to help them with their employees, how to engage the employees during this crisis. That's awesome. Now, we're facing a multitude of crises, which makes this unique. Yeah. We have Right now, we have four crises that are global. You mm-hmm. have the pandemic. You have the mental health crisis, which as of right now is depression, anxiety, and stress-related symptomatologies up at an astounding 800%, you guys. Wow. Not 80%. Eight hundred percent, and those are the statistics as of the end of um, as of the end of May. The June statistics haven't come out yet. Wow. So eight hundred percent, people are struggling mightily. Yeah, uh, is is that affecting uh, the uh, economic and financial crisis because of the shutdown of the economy? And and then on top of that, you have the racial and social injustice and social upheaval. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, human beings are capable. Of, we're very resilient as human beings. We're capable of handling one crisis that we have before in our lives. Yeah. personal crisis, but not four at the same time. This yeah. is really hard right now. Yeah, it's really hard. People are feeling it big time. I want to talk about, just quickly touch on the mental illness thing. I mean, yes. no one is talking about this and people are struggling. Like they, mm-hmm. they are struggling on multiple levels. I mean, critical levels and just like daily functioning levels. And it's, it's yes. just been really, really hard and it's, and there's a lot of contention and, and so not only are we dealing with crisis, but we're dealing with massive amounts of like inflammation, you know, like everyone's angry, everyone's yes. triggered, everyone's traumatized. Like, I think this is probably the first time in decades that the entire planet has been trauma, like united under trauma over something. Maybe the last time was World War II. I don't know. I, I guess. You're exactly right. In our lifetime, you know, I'm, you know, we, we have not faced anything like that. World War II was the last time that we had something of, of this level. And, and suicide hotline is at an all time high. Yeah. Drug and alcohol abuse is on an all time high. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by the way, the mental, the eight hundred percent of increase of depression, anxiety. These were people that were not clinically diagnosed as depressed and anxious prior to that. Wow. These are all new people, basically, that are struggling. Wow. That will give you an indication. We're not talking about existing people that struggle with that for whatever reason in their lives. We're talking about people that were living normal lives and were functioning mm-hmm. pretty well, basically, until this hit and yeah. this tidal wave. Um, and the other thing is this: there seems to be no end in sight. Yesterday in the United States, we had the highest number of positive cases, 66,000 in one day, mm-hmm. which only broke the record from last Monday at 62,000. Mm-hmm. So we're going, in a di- we're going in the wrong direction. Yeah. And, you know, if Dr. Fauci, who I, I think is a great man, you know, he, he does his job as best as he knows how, were to come out in March and said, look, this pandemic is going to last until July 1st. You better buckle down. And, but after that, it's going to be fine. I think most of us would say, Oh my gosh, that's three and a half months away. But you know what? I think I can make it. Mm -hmm. Now we're in the middle of July. Even if he came out today and said, you know what? But by Halloween, October 31st, it's going to be over. We'll go back to normal life. I think even though we're all exhausted and tired, we could still somehow say, you know what? Okay, August, September, three and a half more months. It's going to be hard because I'm already just exhausted. But I think I can make it. The problem is that there is no end in sight. There's none. Right. Initially, they told us, come summertime, the temperatures are going to go up. The virus can't survive that these temperatures are going to go up. The way. Well, that's not true. It's mm-hmm. getting worse. Yeah. So the fact that all this uncertainty has no end date is increasing our stress and our anxiety. Totally. Totally. That, I, And I've never even thought of it that way, where it's like, just give me a date and a time. Like, give yeah, me a deadline. Yeah, we need a target. We need a target. If we had a target, I think we can make it. Right. But no target... And ongoing and getting worse, there's global fatigue. 
Total. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, global fatigue. I love the way that you said that. And that's not even touching on all of the individual crises that people are going through, right? Because everyone probably has something in their life that, that reaches crisis level, at least occasionally. And then there's all the global stuff on top of that. Mm-hmm. So the four crises we talked about just now, we we had an interview a couple of months ago and one of the the lady that was interviewed says, you know what, exactly what you said, I'm going through a divorce. Yeah. I have five kids. Mm -hmm. I was going through a divorce before the pandemic. I'm still going through a divorce. That's my own personal crisis. I'm trying to find myself. I'm trying to recreate myself and start a new career and take care of it. And then all these things hit. Mm -hmm. And I, up until that point, I had never thought about the individual crisis that already existed. And then you throw in these three or four on top of that. Totally. It's, it's debilitating. Totally. It's, yeah, totally it's, it's amazing that we're still functioning as a society, to be honest, <laughs> when you look at it that way. I don't think we could even call this functional. Well, like, I mean, we haven't imploded, that's true. but we're not functioning. But I mean, there's, but you know what? I, I think that, and I, I, I'm sure Dr. Ely will agree with me that people are a lot more resilient than we give ourselves mm-hmm. credit for. That's true. We are. And again, we can handle one or two crises at the same time. Last week, you know, uh, my wife and I took this epic adventure in the midst of this pandemic, going to travel, traveling and going to Alaska, you know, Mm -hmm. for two weeks. And then we got on the plane to fly back. Now, I haven't flown on a plane since the pandemic started. So this was my first experience. Yeah. So we get on a plane in Anchorage, Alaska, 6 a.m. in the morning. There's nobody at the airport. So it was fine. We got to Seattle to to, to on our second flight. Mm -hmm. And I walked around the terminal, a lot of people there, there was no joy. Mm -hmm. There was an absence of a smile. There was no laughter. Kids were not running around having fun. It was this sad, uh, subdued environment. Or or even on the plane, you know, getting up and trying to go to the restroom in the back of the plane. And you're walking past and you're making eye contact with people that are sitting there. If they make eye contact with you, Mm -hmm. they're wearing masks. And they're scared to death. Mm -hmm. They're scared to death. And it's the first time that I truly experienced, because here in Colorado, we've been in a real bubble. We haven't felt the, you know, the pandemic like a, a, most other states have in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. and other parts of the world. So we've been somewhat less than protected. Yeah. But seeing the lack of joy and the fear in people's faces was heartbreaking for me because right. mm-hmm. I hadn't experienced that. Right. And, and, and that's, that's bleeding into our culture now. Well, like- I had a similar experience, actually. Just today at the grocery store, I realized how much I miss being able to get somebody's cart from them as they are finishing up at the grocery store. Like someone would be unloading from their, their grocery cart to their car. And I would just take theirs and say, thank you. We can't do that anymore. Like we we can't even interact with each other, much less share surfaces like that. And it's, it's really sad to me. It let me share something even more uh, uh, to me. It was profoundly sad. I had a, obviously every meeting is taking place through zoom nowadays. So my meeting, my work meetings, I met with this lady very accomplished lady. And she told me the phone, she goes, I haven't hugged another human being in four months. It's really sad. Think yeah. about what she just said. Yeah. Yep. It, and how important physical contact it is for our souls, for right. our beings to connect with another human being. Yep. You I, know, she's single and loneliness is at an all time high. Yeah. Loneliness is, is as debilitating impact on one's physical health. Yep. I saw, There's a recent study about yeah. the broken heart syndrome. Do you know what a broken heart syndrome is? I can imagine. Like with you know, it affects the heart mm-hmm. physically. Yeah. These were people that didn't have a heart disease. Yeah. But they're suffering from a broken heart syndrome, quote yeah. unquote. Yep. It's really sad. I was watching a someone posted a video of these two young cousins, like around the age of eight. And it was the first time they'd hugged and I'm gonna cry. That was the first time they hugged in months and they embraced and they burst out crying. And it was just really so sad to see, you know, because in the beginning, like they're smiling, right? Like, oh, we're going to hug. We're going to hug. Like everything's fine. Everything's fine. And then they hug and you see everything is not okay. People are not okay, you know? And, um, and that just, I'm worried about our children. Like how are our children interpreting yeah. this like how are they you know children aren't they they can't use their words to express their fear you know but you get it in little glimpse right and i see that in tennyson um someone else was telling me on instagram how her nephew is too scared to come out of his room because he's scared he's going to kill his grandparents mm-hmm. you know and I like know. this is like That's a six-year-old like this is a six like can you imagine being six and being like i am a deadly force 
and, and having that burden upon them yes. at a young age. Because there's this intergenerational disconnection now because we are afraid about the, our parents and our grandparents. Yeah. It, which is, you know, it's yeah. true. It's, and it's so this, that's what I am. It's that ripple effect that there, there's so many ripple effects happening right now. So many. And we're, we just keep looking at like this, this teeny tiny little droplet that's falling. Right. And it's the COVID cases and it's this, but what about the ripples? Like, what about the millions of ripples that we are seeing that are going to cause so much turbulence down the line and no one is tallying that and it's coming and it's going to hit us hard and, and we're going to be like, holy crap crap like what yeah, there's we another done? stunning statistic coming out of the united nations recently because of the economic shutdown which mm-hmm. is the impact the economy has had around the world that by the end of this year we will have half a billion people that's 500 million people who are going to be on the verge of starvation yeah that's think really about sad. these people who you know we sometimes say well i'm living paycheck to paycheck or day to day mm-hmm. there are people that are living meal to yeah. meal yeah. exactly Exactly. I, I think it's something I remember reading this years ago, but like 75% of the world's population lives off of like two to $5 a day. And that's it. And so now we're, we, we're taking that vulnerable it, like population and we're starving them to death because right. our economies are crashing and they're the ones that are feeling it the most because so, they're, 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 their economy, their world is so fickle that any, you just look the wrong way and it crashes and that's what they're experiencing now. Sorry, what were you going to say? I haven't said all that. There's a big difference between danger and fear. That's one of the premises yeah. of the book. Danger is real. If somebody came up to you and coughed in your face, that's dangerous. And that's not a political statement. That's a factual medical statement. Yeah. Sure. Fear, on the other hand, is not your friend mm-hmm. because making decisions based on fear yeah. Fear is paralyzing. Fear is. is, you know, destabilizing. Fear is, there's no way to live our lives because I see fear all around. So let's separate those two. Yeah. Yes, protect ourselves. And, and especially if you have a compromised immune system or if you're older and so on, I totally get it. Yeah. But let's not live life through fear because yeah. that actually causes even more damage. Yeah. On all kinds of levels, spiritual levels, emotional, mental, and ultimately physical because all those things are interconnected. Yeah. And, you know, I can say Big from difference between the two. Yeah, and I can say from personal experience that uh, fear has been a lot more damaging in my life than the actual dangers that I've experienced. Right. Yes. Because the fear yes. has no limits, right? It, it's right. it's infinite, and if you let it carry you away, it will take you to a very very dark place. Right. Yes. And so you talk about the differences between danger and fear in your book, correct? Yes. That's really yeah. awesome. I can't like, I actually haven't read your book yet and I can't wait to, like, I'm just dying to, to read it. Um, what are you, you talk about in your book, the four personality types when dealing with a crisis. Can you go into yeah. that this a little bit more? Part of the book, by the way, every interview, <laughs> people love this. Here's mm-hmm. the four personality types for any crisis, but let's, you know, for this one, the, the first one is what we like to call the victim. And mm-hmm. the victim basically is like, why is this happening to me? Why? Yeah. What did I do to deserve this? You know, mm-hmm. so they're, you know, they feel sorry about themselves. And obviously victim, if you stay for too long, you become depressed if you live in that state. Yeah. The second group is, we call them the critic. Mm-hmm. Now, how does the critic behave? The critic basically, regardless of what the federal, state, or local government, or the World Health Organization, or even the United Nations says, regardless of that, they criticize everything. Mm-hmm. For example, Tristan you should wear a mask when you go outside. Well, that's stupid. All right. Tristan, don't wear a mask when you go outside. Well, that's stupid too. Like, no matter what yeah. you say, they're going to criticize. <laughs> it doesn't matter. matter. Yeah. You're going to criticize everything. That's group number two. Group number three is we, we, we call that the bystander. A good person, mind you, but the bystander is the deer with the headlights look. Mm -hmm. The bystander is so overwhelmed by the changes that are happening and feeling so out of control because it, the, you never know what every day brings, right. that they basically do nothing. Yeah. They, they, they look to see what the neighbors are doing. They look to the left, they look to the right, and they're immobilized and paralyzed by fear, yeah. Tristan, just like we talked about. Mm-hmm. And in essence, they do nothing. And what these first three personality types have in common is that they offer no solutions. Yeah. Right. They don't move forward. Basically, they don't do anything. Mm-hmm. Now, you come up with the navigator, which is the fourth personality type, and the navigator, and this is the whole premise of the book, right? The navigator begins 
Number one, with a positive attitude. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to go through the seven keys real quickly to, yeah. to tell you how people navigate through success. And then we can talk about them in, in more detail. They, they practice self-care, which is the first key. They're aware of their environment. They're aware of what's going on in the, in, in the triggers. They practice flexibility and adaptability. And we'll, and we'll again, remember, you know who's going to survive this crisis? The people who are flexible and adaptable, not the strong, yet yeah. that, the flexible ones. And then they prepare for the crisis. They, they take initiative. And, and ultimately, as a result of all those things, they perform acts of kindness and they help what other people who are less fortunate than them because they're in a good place. So the call to action for each one of us is to become a navigator. Mm-hmm. Now, having said that, all four of those personality types exist within each human being because yeah, it's yeah. human nature. And I'll use myself as an example. When this, when March came and the pandemic hit, all my speaking engagement, I had engagements all over the world. You know what happened to them? Canceled. They disappeared. Poof, mm-hmm. gone. Overnight, one email after another, cancel, 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 cancel. So I had the bystander look like, huh? Like, I didn't know what to do. I, I was like frozen in fear. Yeah. And, I, and I felt like a victim. It's like, man, I'm just... You know, becoming an international keynote speaker last year, my influence is growing. I'm so excited to travel and see these places, and mm-hmm. they're all gone. Mm-hmm. So I felt like, a, like poor me, kind of, right? Yeah. Yep. And have I been critical of the government? Yes, actually, I have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I have. Uh, personally, I have. For we some all things have. I yeah. disagree with. Yeah, we all have. My, <laughs> that's, that's me, anyway. Again, the, but the point is, you don't want to be stuck in victim, critic, or bystander mode. Do it for an hour and then pivot and shift over to navigate. Yeah. So this book, by the way, it was us, my friend Costa and I navigating. And because we we both had, I mean, he's a consultant like I am. We, we both had these challenges, but then we decided to do something about it. Mm-hmm. And we moved into action. And that action produced, you know, hopefully this lovely little book yeah. that we're very proud of. And as a result, a lot of good things have happened. I'm not saying that I'm not going to feel like a victim again or I'm not going to be critical, but I, I'm not going to stay there. If yeah. I stay critical, I stay negative, and that hurts me. Mm-hmm. So to yeah. me, it's all about action right now. It's not about, you know, being frozen again and paralyzed by fear. So I, w- would you say that that's the key then to going yeah. from the, the bystander or the victim to the navigator? It's it's just act. Just do mm-hmm. something. It, yes. Take, first of all, start off, you know, I realized that, I've never experienced, I'm a lot older than you guys. I'm like your dad, basically, in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. But I've never experienced anything like that in my lifetime. Janique, you're right. World War II was the last time we had something like this. Yeah. And I'm like, and that's when I felt like, you know, that, that voice said to me, you need to rise, you need to do something about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And But I'm an optimist by nature. And I'm like, you know, this may have bring us down to one knee, but the humanity is going to survive this. We're going to be, we're going to come out of it. Yeah. And I believe we're going to come out of it perhaps transformed and a lot better. I, yeah. I have great hopes for humanity as a result of what happened. I call this the great pause. Mm-hmm. It, it, it forced everybody to pause in place for several months and we're still in pause in a lot of ways. And we have, so many people have said, you know what, it's a, it is a blessing in disguise. Now, yes, millions of people have gotten sick and mm-hmm. people have died and I'm not minimizing that. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that there, there, there are things that will happen as a result of this pandemic in the end that hopefully will be for the betterment of society. I hope so. I, I, I sincerely lo- believe that. I, I love that. Pay attention. Go ahead. And, and that's not just an optimist to me. I, that's my observation. You know, I'm still a psychologist at hand in my hand. I still wear my psychology hat and I observe and I look at society and I see trends. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, the, you know, the work from home trend um, is a wonderful trend, actually. If, yeah. if people can do it and manage it in a way that they have a greater balance, they spend more time with their loved ones, they mm-hmm. commute less, yeah. that means there are less cars on the road, that means yeah. less pollution, yep. less carbon. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But there are things that are, that are very good that are going to come out of this. Totally. I want to add to your, the, it's it's victim, it's the deer in the headlights, it's the critic, and it's the, what's the fourth one? Navigator. The navigator. The navigator. The someone who navigates through this crisis, yes. I, I want to add to that a little bit, because I always say, you know, when, when you've hit something hard, you know, it's it's easy to stay stuck and stew and go into a dark space. But I say, 
you need to give as much energy to healing, to moving forward as you do to the victimness, mm-hmm. to the deer in the headlights, yes. to, you know, if, if your energy, if 100% of your energy is going towards that one direction, then it's just a downhill spiral, right? But if you're utilizing as much energy, if not more, being positive and creating a, a force for good, you know, then then you will come out of that, right? I always, I always, a lot of people know, I do a lot of rants on Instagram, where I am the critic, I do criticize the government, I do criticize our culture. And then I say, now, this is what we do about it. Mm-hmm. Put your money in the right place. Exactly. Start making good choices. Start exactly. doing this. Like, yes, there's a problem. Now let's move towards the solution, like collectively, mm-hmm. right? And like, let's exactly. all let's all make the shift because getting like utilizing all that energy is just getting people angry. You know, it's like, well, okay, now what do we do with that anger? Oh, we we break things. <laughs> no, no, no. Let's use it for creative change, for mm-hmm. good change, for healthy change, right? And so I really like that analogy. I, I love those four uh, mm-hmm. different. Uh, I, I love them too because it it shows the flexibility in mm-hmm. how we relate to the world around us because we can get so caught up in identifying with one particular dimension of right. this, right? If we become the victim and we feel like the victim is us, then not only do we get stuck in that, but we also start to lash out at people who don't share that same place, right? Like Johnny had an experience with this and you can probably tell it better than I can, where she was talking to people about the, the good of the big pause of how we can take a step back and enjoy being with our family more slowing down. And do you remember that? What I'm happened? Sure. It was a long time ago. She, she got a really angry message from someone who basically told her she was a terrible person for not acknowledging oh, yeah. the pain oh, yeah. of all of the victims. Yes, that, that I had the same experience that you did, Janique, because I posted about the, the benefits of the great pause, you know, and this was kind of early on. And for the most part, we're like, we love your, uh, you know, thanks for your optimism, your positivity and so on. But one person actually totally slammed me. I said, you're mm-hmm. being so insensitive. I've never mm-hmm. seen such a cold hearted person. I'm like, yeah. mm-hmm. because I didn't say, that the death isn't real or it's not happening around us. Right. I wouldn't say anything like that. I, my heart goes out to people that have suffered from that. Mm-hmm. My own nephew and my brother got COVID mm-hmm. I mean, they, in New York early on. Wow. So wow. I'm very mindful of that. However, there's still a lot of great things that are going to come out of it. Right. That's still a fact. Right. So anyway, I'm sorry that you had that experience, Janine. It wasn't pleasant for me either, but it is what it is. It's okay. I get that experience all the time. <laughs> but but it's <laughs> also, like you know, in a way, it's really helpful <laughs> because it uh, it reminds us that our perspective is not the only one, right? Exactly. That even when we are able to accomplish the navigator personality type, there are other people around us that may not be there yet. And that means that they're going right. to need us to relate to them in a different right. way than we might otherwise. You're right. It's, it's, oh, you're right about that. It's almost synergistic where it's like, you know, like when people do say this is very painful, it, it helps me to remember like, yeah, there are people that are suffering on that level, you know, and to be more sensitive to it, mm-hmm. but to also hold space for hope for those people that they right. know that there is room for growth away from the trauma that they are experiencing. Right. We can have compassion for where they are, but that doesn't mean we need to allow them to stay there, right? Mm-hmm. Without trying to lift them up. Yes. And uh, again, we need to be the example, Tristan and, and Jenny, we need to be the example that, like I said, I was the victim and the bystander initially. There's no question about it. Mm-hmm. But I pivoted, I changed, I shifted to something that helped me become more productive and, and bring something good to this world as a result of that. Yeah, exactly. Because believe me, at the beginning of 2020, there were no plans to write a book. Mm-hmm. I mean, this, this is not, this is, <laughs> but that's, talks about flexibility and adaptability, which is the third path. And let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. So, we like to use the example of the oak tree and the palm tree. Mm-hmm. You know, the oak tree is this powerful, strong tree that's been around for a hundred years. But if there's enough rain, enough moisture, and enough wind, guess what happens to oak trees? They come crashing down on people's homes or cars or even kill people. Mm-hmm. The palm tree, on the other hand, at the peak of the hurricane of the storm, it bends all the way down to the ground, parallel to the ground. But when the storm passes, it rises up again Mm -hmm. and survives the storm. So I'm asking people to be more like palm trees and less like oak trees. Meaning, well, I've always done things this way. I'm not changing. This Mm -hmm. is it. Uh, You know what? This world has changed. We cannot continue to do things the way we used to do prior to to the pandemic Mm -hmm. and expect successful results. That's not going to happen. So we all have to change. And that's not a bad thing that we have to get outside our comfort zone. And, and, and do things differently this time. I actually think that's part of our growth. Mm-hmm. 
Totally. Yeah. In fact, in our own business, um, nearly every great thing that we've created has been the result of going through a, a bit of a crisis, right? Like my cancer was the first thing that basically created the business. And then when our hyperbaric oxygen chambers got shut down, mm -hmm. that actually enabled us to focus on other aspects of the business and really grow out the kind of the consultations and things. Right. And then when COVID hit, it created a whole other shift for us. And every single one of these shifts has been awesome. And they would not have happened had there not been that crisis there, or if we had not been flexible enough to adapt and change. Totally. But that's the key that you recognize it. And you, again, you pivoted, you moved over. You said, okay, that didn't work. Let's try something different. And, mm -hmm. and a new door opened up. Exactly. And that, it's beautiful to hear that. People need to hear stories of success like that in the midst of this, because the news are so depressing. Mm -hmm. So they, depressing. They say, you know what? It's not about just surviving this crisis. I'm even talking about thriving during the crisis. Mm -hmm. And I know people look at me kind of funny. It's like, how can we thrive through this? Believe me, it's possible. You know, it's, but, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, what's been really interesting throughout this whole thing is um, Tristan and I don't have TV. We have Netflix and Disney Plus, and that's really it. So all the news that we get is stuff that we have self-researched. And so I think that's why I feel so disconnected from people's fear, because I'm I'm realizing that I, I was at my mother-in-law's and their little smart doorbell thing has like a screen and it has like commercials on the screen. And a lot of them were like COVID commercials, mm -hmm. you know, or and, and it was like, so many deaths and call this crisis hotline for COVID and did it. And I was like, Whoa, like, and then the TV is on and they're talking about all of these negative things about COVID. And I'm like, Holy cow, people are marinating in this mm -hmm. day and night. You go and get your nails done. COVID news is on. You go and like, it, like people can't stop talking about all the worst parts of it. It's and like it's, an IV drip of fear. Yes. Like throughout the day, they are microdosing on this fear throughout the day. And then that's all that their reality is. And so I realized on Saturday that that was my disconnect where I'm like, this is why I can't relate to people because they are, they're getting their, they, they're funneling their attention to nay, 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 nay. And I'm trying to funnel my attention to progress, progress, change, adapt, get a healthy immune system. And the news doesn't talk about immune system. The news doesn't talk about being proactive. The news doesn't talk about getting vitamin C. What it does talk about is social isolation and putting your mask on and staying at home. Right. And so, yeah, no wonder people are so depressed and so terrified all the time. I'm going to ask Tristan for permission to use what you just said, the Ivy drip of fear. Oh, That's absolutely. exactly what's happening. Yeah. Part of the self-care, which is the first key to happiness, we're asking you know, our readers and the audience basically is to unplug from media exactly mm -hmm. what you just said because everything is breaking news. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. no way you can have breaking news every hour yep. on the hour, 24-7, when the breaking news is exactly the same thing about, okay, 100 more people died this hour, a 1,000 more today. That is it's so toxic. It's so toxic. It's toxic to our soul. So I have unplugged like you have from media. Everything's on the internet that I choose to read yes. from sources that I trust, by the way. Mm -hmm. Not just anything out there. And so I'm aware of what's happening, but I don't need to hear it or, or watch it on television. I haven't watched TV other than Netflix for about three and a half months. Yep. Because I, I unless it's in, you know, sports are starting to come back a little bit. I'm watching a little bit of that. But basically, because it's not good for my health, no. my mm -hmm. mental and or physical right. health. Well, and here's the thing too. That's not oh. thing. People say, "Are oh, you burying your head in the sand?" Mm -mm. No, I, I'm aware of what's happening. I read, I read news yep. of my own choosing, yep. but I'm not going to inundate myself with negativity in my home or for myself. I'm not doing it. It's not good for me. Well, and one thing to to realize about the media is, for the first time in decades, they have your attention and they and they're racking up the money right? They are not going to let this go. Mm -mm. They're like, oh my gosh, like people are watching us again. And so they're, they're going to milk this. They're going to milk it. Yeah, and they're going to, like you said, these like breaking news and the more devastating. And the music and the, and the thundering music mm -hmm. in the background. Dun, Seriously. Dun, dun, dun. But all the time, no wonder people are stressed out. Mm -hmm. Totally. It's, it's like, it's subconscious, like, programming basically and you know I, I i shared an insta story a while it's ago not even that subliminal. it's not even that subconscious or it's subliminal. not <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very it's Pretty very hard. obvious but yet people are eating it up like candy right i shared a story an insta story a while ago where i used to work for someone who 
who used a lot of fear tactics to, to drum up business. And I said, listen, if you instill fear in anyone, you can sell like snow to an Eskimo because fear is triggering and it's charging and people will pay anything to get rid of their fear. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the media does to us. They, they drum up fear, they get you terrified and then they've hooked you right now you're hooked and now you are, you are there. I don't know, but, but you're stuck. And so, yeah, fear, fear is the biggest salesperson ever. And so, yes, let's feel the fear Let's, let's recognize that we're scared, but let's get constructive about our energy as well and not funnel it all, all towards uh, fear in that. Exactly. Can you tell us a little bit more about the seven other... Well, um, I'm specifically curious about preparation. Um, why is that important for navigating a crisis and what goes into that? You know, and the preparation is actually more, more simple. Like, you know, you can... And, and in the book, we talk about, you know... Even having a, you know, a 72 hour, you know, backpack for food storage for a month or something, or even have some cash in the home. I mean, it's very, very practical. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they actually to physically be prepared. And again, there are other crises. It's not just a pandemic. I mean, if, if you have a hurricane in Florida or if you have a, an earthquake or, a, a, you know, some kind of even social upheaval or you have you don't have the ability to go to pick up your medication from the pharmacy mm -hmm. because there's some kind of breakdown of social order. Like to be able to, to have some things at home that brings you a little bit of peace of mind right. because you literally don't know from one day to the next. I mean, our economy was shut down almost overnight Yeah, in, in a very scary way, by the way. And uh, so uh, people were unprepared. This is what I'm finding out. And those that were prepared actually have been able to navigate this crisis better. Right. So, yeah, we, know, uh, I mean, we can make fun of toilet paper or whatever, but whatever the case may be, <laughs> you know, people were unprepared about certain things. For sure. And that was a, that was a really big issue in the, uh, kind of the natural health world back when this whole thing started, because we, we have a large community of practitioner, uh, colleagues and friends. Um, most of them were doing wonderfully before COVID hit. And then overnight their businesses went from thriving to dead and, Unfortunately, yeah. many of them were not prepared for that. They didn't know anything about telehealth or social media marketing or anything. So they, they were having these, these really serious crises, basically saying, my business is going to shut down. I have, I have nothing left. And what was so sad about that is that in our yeah. specific community, someone had been pushing for people to learn about telehealth and how to create a virtual practice for a year. For a year, they've been saying, learn this, come join this program, get this education. It will change your business forever. And they said, no, we're good. We're good. We're comfortable how exactly, we are. Because they, because they were good. They were comfortable. They were mm -hmm. good before this. Absolutely. Now, I'm glad you brought up healthcare in, in the, uh, in the self self care, basically the first key that, we talk about there's a there's a portion in the book that we talk about self care for healthcare, mm -hmm. like a specific because healthcare workers are doctors, nurses, physician assistants, basically the the people on the front lines, the true heroes of you know who have fought this pandemic tooth and nail day in and day out. By their own admission, this, this is not uh, Dr. Ilya speaking. It's them themselves saying we are suffering from post traumatic stress disorder. Yeah. And we can we can even begin to address this until we have to wait until the pandemic is over and then go into counseling. Yep. And why is that? Because people went into the mental health, into the uh, uh, doctors and physicians. They took the Hippocratic oath, you know, do no harm, help others. They go through medical school. None of them were trained for what they are facing right now. Physicians and nurses were not trained to hold somebody's hand while they're dying and they're dying by the boatloads and then call the family and say, you know what? Your dad is dying. You can't be here. This is a virtual goodbye, basically. Yeah. No closure. And to and as people are dying, because people can't physically come to the hospital and say goodbye to their loved ones that are dying. Right. There are no funerals. There's no, and then, so they have that going on. They work with patients all the time. They're afraid of getting sick themselves and tens of thousands of doctors across the globe have gotten sick and died. Yeah. In Italy alone, where like 6,000 doctors and nurses have died. It's awful. Or they're afraid to bring it back home. So a lot of them have actually stayed in, in a hotel. 
They, they, so they're separate from their loved ones because they have elderly parents at home or kids and mm-hmm. they don't want to bring the fires to them. And, and they have all this stress at, at, at work and they're sandwiched in between. So our healthcare workers need our help. And, and we're, I mean, we're here to provide as much help as we can to them. Um, so there's a self-care for healthcare. That's almost a separate program, basically. Mm-hmm. How to help those. To me, they're heroes, honestly. And they're sacrificed a lot for us and for the world. Well, I love that because that opens up the conversation of, you know, individuals listening to this right now, there is probably something that they can be doing to prepare for what's next in the pipeline. It may not be mental health because they may not be mental health care workers, but they probably have some kind of skill, some kind of knowledge, some kind of talent that will benefit society when the time is right, when we get to that point. And preparing now is what's going to put them in the right position to accomplish that. Absolutely. The other thing is that early on in the book, you know, as a result of this, I created what I would call a personal health assessment. So 20 questions takes you like a minute to go through it, basically. And it looks at four areas of your life, your physical health, your emotional health, your mental health and your spiritual health. Just to give you an idea, how am I doing in these different areas right now? So there are four or five questions per category and it gives you a, a score at the end. And the idea is, you may re- recognize that in some areas, actually, I'm doing pretty well, better than I thought. In some other areas, I'm really struggling. So you can address them. And then as you read the book, and always at, at the end of every chapter, we have points for the reader to consider mm-hmm. and to meditate on and to deeply think about about their lives. A couple questions. And then what we like to call is take action, again, to navigate. So as you go through the book, it's almost like a workbook. You get to the end, and then we ask you to retake this personal health assessment to see how much you've improved. Because sometimes it's difficult to say, I don't know, am I better? Am I, am I happy? How, how do you measure that? So we wanted to make it in a way that's tangible mm-hmm. and, and easy to, uh, to understand. So the personal health assessment, actually, you can download it and take it yourself. It, it's very easy to do. That's awesome. Is there a... It will give you a lot of information. It will give you a lot of information about where you are in these areas. And, and you said that that's in the book, but also online? Yeah, I can send it to you. You can send it to your readers. Do it for free. Just because I want people to, uh, let me send that to you after so okay. you can include it in the podcast. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, we'll put that up in the show notes. But that that's awesome. I mean, this book is basically like a, a master class in crisis management, right? Because it's not yeah. just something that you read and you learn about intellectually. It has steps to help you implement it so that it becomes a lived part of your experience. <clears throat> yes. And um, there is a was a just recent uh, study from 15,000 HR executives, and said these are our top challenges right now. So this is more on the business side. Mm-hmm. Number one, listen to this: ensuring the mental and physical well-being of our employees. Mm-hmm. That's the number one challenge around the world of is for, in terms of companies. Mm-hmm. And I won't read all of them, but number two, you know, maintaining employee engagement, productivity, and effectiveness because people coming back to work they're scared to death. First of all, some of them are not going to come back to work in 2020, flat out. Physically, mm-hmm. they will stay at home until there's a vaccine out. They're not, I'm not coming back to work. And, and since we're starting to help companies now as they're opening up, here's one of the challenges. Basically, people need to be re-onboarded. You know how you onboard new employees? Mm-hmm. Somebody comes in, you onboard them into their company culture and all that stuff. Well, now, every company and organization has to re-onboard their employees. Even people, and these are existing employees that have been together mm-hmm. For 10, 20 years in the company, because this is the new normal. I know people are tired of hearing that, <laughs> but there's also going to be a next normal. Right. We're not going back to business as usual. That's not going to happen. And so now here's what you have. People go back to work and you have a meeting, your first meeting, right? Mm-hmm. Even with social distancing, half the room is wearing masks. The other half is not. Mm-hmm. Yep. Half the room is saying, you're putting my life in jeopardy. You're selfless. You don't care about me. I thought you were my colleague, my friend. You're not putting a mask. The other half is going, you know what? This is America. I'm a free person and I'm not sick. I'm not coughing on anybody. I'm not going to wear a mask. Mm-hmm. And you have HR in the middle trying to negotiate yeah. this very tense and scary situation. And this is happening across the board with companies. And that's why they're, they're bringing us in to do just that. Just that. That's really just cool. to help them negotiate yeah. so people can be more comfortable and therefore, you know, be more productive again. Yeah, that's, that's so true. I hadn't thought about that aspect of it, but that would be 
a bit of a nightmare for a big company to try to reintegrate everybody yeah. after everything that we've been through. Tomorrow, I'm doing a, a webinar with Bank of America in New York, all their New York employees. There are 700 people, employees that are signed up for it. Wow. Because wow. learn how to net, they begin to open up in New York. New York is a little bit better now than, although they suffered greatly. It was ground zero. Yeah. So they're starting to begin to, okay, it's time to start opening up some of the branches, some of the people, so on. Wow. And they've asked me to come in and help them to, to teach them how to navigate this new normal in mm-hmm. a lot of ways and do it successfully. So yeah. that's, uh, it, I'm telling you, it's, it's happening across the board. So another cool thing about the book is that what it sounds like is that navigating a crisis for an individual is not all that different from navigating a crisis as a group. And, exactly. and so if we develop the ability to handle personal crises, that actually sets us up to be really great leaders to help our communities manage crises as well. Yeah, absolutely. And again, we didn't set out to right. We in, in, initially it was just for individuals only because we hadn't thought about the business side of it. We just wanted to help people. Mm-hmm. But it, it's what's happening now as people are coming to us and saying, we need your help. We need your help. And so we're trying to do as much as we can. I mean, it's, it's a, I mean, it's, I don't want to say it's great, but it's, it's good to see that people are actually, it's that the message of the book resonates with so many people mm-hmm. in organizations. Yeah. Have we gone over, which, which keys have we gone over so far? Oh, well, we've hit on almost all of them. Um, I, I had a question though on, on kindness and we've been kind of brushing up against this because one of the things that has happened as a result of all of these different crises that we are going through, uh, is we've become extremely polarized. We were already polarized, but now it is, it is vicious in a lot of circles. Totally. Yeah. So how, how does one really harness the power of kindness in a way that, that makes a difference in the community when you feel very yeah, passionately it's a, it's about a great something? Question. Yeah, it's a great question. And as you can see that, you know, first we start with self care kind of self is like take care of ourselves, but we end the seventh key of course is kindness. Mm-hmm. And I, I invoke this challenge to anyone that's listening right now. No matter where you are in your life, in your, there's somebody else out there, whether it's in your community, in your own family, perhaps, in your, in your town, in your village, in your city, in your state, in your country, or in the world that's worse off than you are. Right. And I've, got, I've had some pushback with the kindness from people that said, well, you know, I'm already struggling myself. I'm so stressed out. Mm-hmm. How can you ask me to help somebody else? Am I my brother's keeper? I'm like, no, you're not your brother's keeper. You're your sister's keeper and your mother's keeper and your stranger's keeper and the homeless person in India keeper. Mm-hmm. Because we're all brothers and sisters in this world and it's our, it's part of our humanity to help somebody else that's worse off than we are. Yeah. If you're listening even right now, I promise you there's somebody else worse than you. And if you help them and lift them up and, and people say, well, how can I do that? I can't even see people anymore. Mm-hmm. Pick up the phone, mm-hmm. text them saying, Janique, Tristan, I'm thinking about you. I love you. Do you need anything? What can I do for you? Sometimes that mere act of reaching out is enough to help somebody who's really down. If you get a prompting that says, you know, so-and-so, do not hesitate. Do it right away. Mm. The worst thing they'll tell you is like, well, Tristan, I'm actually doing pretty good, but thanks for calling me. Thanks for thinking of me. Uh-huh. That's the worst thing that can happen. Mm. The most likely scenario, however, is it's funny that you should call me. Because I've been really having a hard time. Yeah. I Early on, I think it was like in middle of April, I had this very strong impression to reach out to a good friend of mine in Greece. And, you know, and this lady is a professor. This is a master's from USC. I mean, American born, uh, educated here. Just fantastic lady. I've known her for 40 years. I call her up and she was shocked. She goes, it's funny you should call me. I'm like, I said, I don't know. And her name is Eleni, Helen. I said, why are you calling me? I said, I don't know. I just had this problem to call you. Are you doing okay? She goes, you know what? I've got asthma and I'm isolating in my in a friend's apartment. I haven't seen a human soul in 30 days. Wow. Not, nobody. Mm. And I'm lonely. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I, I thought of you. I'm going to be reaching out to you every week wow. from the U.S. I'm going to be calling you to Greece to check in on you. She goes, you know what? I really appreciate that. That's a true story. Wow. So we, there's all kinds of things we can do that don't take a lot of time necessarily, but you have to listen with that, you know, with that, listen with your heart and then act upon it. And again, navigate. Don't just listen there and say, well, I'll call them later. Do it now. Mm-hmm. She gets that prompting and reach out to people. They need our help. We need to help one another. I need your help. You need my help. Mm-hmm. You know, it goes back and forth. So 
kindness is a key to personal happiness and personal wellness, as you know, yeah. because when we perform acts of kindness and service, that makes us happy. On the flip side, when you're happy, you do it anyway because it, it comes natural to you. Yeah. So. I love it. Did we, did you guys cover, um, have we covered positive attitude yet? That's um, key number no, six. No, we, we talked about uh, turning off social media and the news okay. and all of that, but no, we haven't really gone into positive attitude. I mean, there's initiative and positive attitude. Elia, mm -hmm. what should we talk about next? I mean, the initiative, of course, is the take action that I'm talking mm -hmm. about. So we've been talking about it throughout this podcast. Oh, okay, uh, okay. Podcast. I think the positive attitude is to remember that no matter what happens, we will overcome this. Yeah. I give you my promise. I guarantee that we will, and we will be better off for it. Yeah. But sometimes we can't do it alone, and it's okay to ask for help. Yeah. I would much rather, you know, you ask for help and say, I'm really struggling and be vulnerable and be open that way than, uh, you know, keep it to yourself and then having something tragic happen. Right. Or suffer in the victim mode for like six months. Totally. Learning that I don't have to stay a victim or be a bystander. I can navigate and, and be, because positive attitude is everything, right? Totally. Be an optimist. It's hard to do when you're inundated, like you talked about, Janique, by the media that right. is killing us. Mm -hmm. The yeah. media is not our friend, basically, not... right now. Honestly. And I feel like the majority of people can say that. Like, no, this, this doesn't serve us. Like, does it serve you? Does it uplift you? No, don't like it. It's like being in a toxic relationship, like an abusive relationship with someone. It's like, well, why are you still with that person? Well, because they inform me. No, 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 no. Cut them off. Right. Like, well, I, I think it, I, I think it comes down to wanting to feel a, a certain sense of control. And as long as you are fully informed of everything going on, you can at least give yourself the illusion of okay, I have all this information, so I have a little bit of control. We know that's not true, but I think that's what kind of drives the addiction to it, why we keep going back to it. Right. I agree, but you can get that information the way that you and I and I do it, that you mm -hmm. guys do it, like from mm -hmm. informed sources, on the internet perhaps, not necessarily television with mm -hmm. the sound mm -hmm. of right. the gloom and doom yeah. and, the, and the images, because I think those are really scary. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are again the big, you know, the, the death toll, I, as I call it. It's, you know, or you call it even better, the, the uh, IV drip of fear. Uh, yeah. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not into that. And that's part of my self-care. I've unplugged. Yeah. And I don't know when I'll plug in again. Maybe I won't. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. When do we ever need it? It's a very liberating um, feeling. Now, I heard something today that I, I loved. It actually gets right back to your point about the positive attitude. I think it was from Gabrielle Bernstein. And she said something along the lines of, when you are confident in the outcome, you have the ability to wait for it to come to pass without panicking. And I think that that's so true here. We may not know exactly how things turn out, but we can be confident that they will turn out. In one way or another, we will get to a place where we feel okay again. And as long as we keep that perspective, maintain that uh, sense of faith in the outcome, we can get through yeah. all of these challenges. We can wait this out, keep a positive attitude and, and become a resource to our communities. Absolutely. And this is it, having a positive attitude doesn't mean it's like, uh, uh, you know, my head is burying the sand. I'm in denial of what's happening out there. Mm -hmm. No, the truth of the matter is that there will be a vaccine in 2021. It will come out. The the, the trial uh, for medications is on the third round right now for mm -hmm. many, many companies. Third round means if this is successful in the third round, then the medication is going to come out, which at least will stop most people from dying. Mm -hmm. I hope. I don't know. Uh, but, but we are and, getting better at treating it. That's, that's a really yeah, important are, fact. Yeah. Yes. So it's not like we're staying idle and waiting for this to pass, you know, on its own somehow. We're going to do something to help. Mm -hmm. And I have total faith in, in that. Actually, it's, it's, it's to me, one of the positive things that has come out because it is a pandemic, like you said, Janique, across the globe, and it doesn't discriminate if you're rich or poor, white or black, mm -hmm. or, you know, we're all getting it. Yeah. Or, I mean, we're exposed to it anyway. Yeah. Is that scientists, from a variety of different countries and companies are working together, which I love that mm -hmm. yeah. because we have a common enemy. And I think that's, that to me, that, that helps my positive outlook yeah. because people are working together to find a solution to this. Mm -hmm. I want to, I want to add something cause, okay. So we kind of went out of order. Key number one is self-care. Key number two is awareness. Mm -hmm. Key number three is flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, number four is preparation. Number five is initiative. Number six is pod positive attitude. Number seven is kindness. I want to go to the self-care one more time. Um, I want to hear your opinions on compassion fatigue. 
um, because that's a word that's been going around. And I want to tell people like you can be compassionate, but don't drown yourself in compassion, right? Do you have any words of wisdom about compassion fatigue? Because Tell you know, me what they explain that to me. Can you explain what you mean by that? Because uh, that wh- phrase, what does that really mean? So, and I'll give an example of what I heard a very long time ago, or it was like a saying, and it said, the human heart wasn't meant to hold the burdens of the world. And so, so it's, it's ah. trying to feel the pain of everyone over and over and oh my gosh, so many people are dying and oh my gosh, so many people are terrified to go to work and oh my gosh, so many people are, you know, like, like that, the example that Tristan, you know, reached out, said about the person who sent this really ugly message to me. And basically what she wanted me to do was have compassion, like, like bleed compassion for her and feel her pain. And, for people. Right. But you do though. And about the you have compassion for other people. That doesn't mean that our life comes to a halt or right. we cry morning, noon and night. Because Exactly. Of, I mean, it, it's part of life. You know what? What's the, people say, are you afraid of catching it? I'm like, you know what? If I catch it, I catch it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. It happens, it happens. Yeah. I can't, there are a lot of things I, I can control in life, but there are also lots of things I can't control. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to be a slave to fear and live my life in, in a fearful mode just because I might catch it. I'm flying to Greece next month. I'm transatlantic. I'm flying, you know, from here to Paris and from Paris to Athens. Planes, you know, I'm going to be around people. Mm-hmm. I could get it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if I get it, so, you know, I'll deal with it. Yeah. And I'm, I believe that I'll deal with it in a successful way, even though I'm getting close to that age where I have to be careful. I still feel I'm going to be okay. I have that belief, honestly, in my heart mm-hmm. that no matter what happens, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Yep. So I really appreciate that. I mean, I don't know that. if that answers the compassion fatigue. Uh, I, I think that there's, there can be almost too much empathy. If that's, yeah. if, I know that sounds kind of weird to say it, yeah. but you can go overboard basically. Yeah. And that becomes at some point detrimental to your own personal health. We need to have balance in all things. Uh, yeah, and I don't, Compassion I don't, and proactivity I, and, you know, positive attitude and kindness. And right. All and, and I don't think compassion requires us to lower our energy to match the person we're right. feeling compassion for. Right. Mm-hmm. We can, we can feel a sense of compassion while still maintaining a high vibration, so to speak. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, and, and, and we can do it by helping others to the degree that we can help others. If mm-hmm. you have young kids, you need to take care of them. You have all your clients that need your help because you're a Healy Foundation and you got to help so many people. So, you know, there's only so much we can do in the end. Totally. Totally. Um, Elia, do you have any other parting words of wisdom or advice for people? Any golden nuggets from or golden gems or... I guess gems are not gold, <laughs> right? But any, any, I guess they're gems. <laughs> so, <laughs> any, you know, any parting words just, of advice? First of all, thank you for having me on your show because it's always such a pleasure to be with people that I love dearly. And, and you know that I would do anything for the two of you and for your kids. And so would my, my dear wife, we love you. We love you. We love you. Likewise. I just want to remind people to separate danger and fear. That's yes. fundamentally, mm-hmm. that makes a big difference in how you're going to live your life. I love that. And, with the four personality types, give yourself, it's okay to be the victim for a little bit, but don't stay there. That, I want to emphasize that or be critical sometimes. That's mm-hmm. fine. Mm-hmm. And, and, and be scared for a little bit, but do it for an hour, not for a week and not for six months. Yep. Right. Because that's harmful to you on every level. Yeah. Navigate and move into action and take initiative and say, what can I do? Yeah. Versus I can't do anything. Everything's out of, that's not true. There's a lot of stuff within our control that we can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me give you a small example. Of it, besides writing the book. Before this happened, I used to walk three days a week for an hour because I had to, because I'm like getting older, I got to get some exercise. Mm-hmm. As a result of this, now I'm walking every single day, seven days a week for an hour, mm-hmm. and I'm doing it because I want to. And that's part of my self-care because I realized, Ilya, that you're, the stress level you're under, it has raised, I need to raise the bar of how to take care of myself. Yeah. And my goal and my hope is that after this pandemic is over, that I've created a new healthy habit, physically mm-hmm. healthy habit. I'm going to continue that for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. So I chose to do something different, maybe to raise my, my own bar in terms of how well I take care of myself. Yeah, I love that. You know, we, Simple example. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a huge thing, but it's something for me. I feel like, you know, I'm moving in the right direction by doing that. So what, yeah. what can you do in your own life? to make a positive change right now Mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Tristan and I mentioned in a, in a earlier podcast, 
how COVID has kind of been a catalyst where people have been very self-reflective and been like, are we healthy? Yeah. Are we a healthy nation? Like, are we making healthy choices? Because COVID is now holding us to a standard that we are not meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, we can't, we can't keep going down this road of standard American diet, fast food, you know, hydrogenated fats, soda on the daily, you know, like it's not sustainable anymore. There's a big bad guy out there that if our immune systems are not doing well, like it's going to come for us and it's not going to be pretty, you know? And so I, because people with compromised immune systems are the ones that have died the most. Mm -hmm. Right. Clearly. Well, well, so th there's to take self care to a whole different level. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so, so it's, it's, I said, COVID is like the catalyst to get us to think about our health and think about our bodies and what we put in our bodies and mm -hmm. how we manage our stress. And so in a way, yes, it's, it's scary, but it's also a great catalyst. It, so it's, it's, it's the yin and the yang. It's a wake up call if we let it be one, mm -hmm. but if all we see is the fear, then yeah. it's not going to do anything for us. Right. Exactly. So. I mean, hydrate, drink more water, yeah. get it, get adequate sleep consistently. Yeah. Not yeah. one, not, not on the weekends, but every day sleep, deep totally. sleep, you know, rejuvenating sleep. All of those things help us big time to strengthen our immune system. Absolutely. Exactly. Well, Elia, thank you so, so, so much. We so good to have you on, you. like always. Always. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm so glad you wrote this book. And it's so funny because when you said you're coming out with the book on Facebook, I'm like, he was writing a book. <laughs> and so now I know you wrote it in like 45 days. So I'm really. I co-wrote it. I can take credit for all of it. I co-wrote it, but yeah. Well, that you co-wrote it. So I'm, yeah. I'm so grateful that the world now has these empowering tools and words of wisdom and advice. So thank you for all the work that you put out there um, into the universe and um, into helping humanity cope during this really hard time. Now, everybody go on to Amazon, look for seven keys to navigating a crisis. It's, it's a quick read and it is just chock full of solid information. And if you actually follow it, you answer all the questions, take the, the questionnaire, it will make a difference in your life. Absolutely. Thank you, Elia. Thank you, guys. You guys are awesome. Keep doing all the great work that you're doing and helping so many people in your sphere of influence. Absolutely. Thank you. And how can people get a hold of you before we close off? You know, go, yeah, you can go to my LinkedIn profile. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one way to do it. Uh, okay. Or DrIliaGregors.com, my website, or TheHappinessCenter.com, but it, it, any one of those three. Perfect, because I know a lot of people are probably going to want to reach out to you. Thank you so, so much. We love you. Love you, too. Mm -hmm. Keep doing the great work that you're doing. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.